Captain Kyle Smith, and this week I sat down for a morning meeting with San Diego Fire Engineer Ben Vernon. Ben shares what it was like to be attacked and stabbed multiple times while on a call in our city. It shook him to the core, but his rebound is now back on track. So how does this relate to financial well-being? Well, as Ben says, financial health is one of the four pillars of mental health. Listen in as he outlines the other three. Hope you guys enjoy it. All right, hey Ben, welcome to the bullpen. Thanks for meeting me. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man, uh, I'm excited to to get your story out there, buddy. We uh, we go back a long way since um, our days down at the academy, and um, life has certainly changed for both of us in, in many great ways, and in some other um, interesting ways that we're going to dive into when we get into your first alarm, which uh, I'm happy you're here to share. But but before we get into all that, thank you. How uh how has the the pandemic affected your life? You're one of these guys that is you know involved in all kinds of things. It's uh it's a privilege to have you uh, here with us today because it is hard to, to pin you down sometimes, but how has coronavirus or, or things in general changed for you? Well, I, I'm very careful who I, I share this with, but uh, COVID is, has been a gift for me. Uh, you said it perfectly. I am always incredibly busy. I'm always spending a lot of plates, trying to balance a very full schedule uh, and COVID just gave me this opportunity to take a break, uh, to stop doing so much, to stop running around. And it allowed me an opportunity to kind of reevaluate my life. Also gave me a chance to really look at my finances, um, kind of get my affairs in order. I wasn't going at 100 miles an hour with my hair on fire. Uh, and it just has, has been wonderful for my health and well-being to take a break. And, and obviously I'm very careful who I share that with because so many people are affected in a negative way, but COVID has been nothing but positive for me in a, in a weird way. Well, yeah, I, I guess, you know, it's, it is a, it's kind of how you look at things. And I agree with you. Um, it's been a, it's been a reset button for a lot of folks to, to get out of the rat race a little bit and to really reflect on the things that are important. Um, if, if nothing else with all this stuff, it's like, um, it, it forces you to, to really appreciate the limited amount of time that we have here and to, to try to do your best to, to live life to the fullest. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm in agreement, man. In some ways it's been, it's been pretty good. Well, uh, well, why don't we dive into your first alarm here as you, uh, as you will well know, uh, here at the San Diego fire department, First alarm assignment consists of four engines and a truck, but here at the firehouse, I'll ask you four questions. You give us one piece of advice. That sound good? Sounds great. Let's do it. All right. Well, here we go. So here comes your first alarm. You know that when you're first in on your first alarm, you got to give a size up. And your size up is who you are, where you work, and how long you've been doing it. Awesome. All right. Um, so my name is Ben Vernon. I'm an engineer paramedic with the San Diego Fire Department. I've been on the job 14 years. Uh, I was a backseater for 12. I uh, spent the last two years driving. It's been a, a wonderful career, an amazing career. I'm having an absolute blast. Uh, I'm now setting my sights on on the next captain's exam, so I've got to start taking those classes to get ready to be a captain. But just uh, loving driving and having a great time. Yeah. Um can you just share with everybody listening here, Ben, how much you enjoy driving, especially the neighborhood you drive in? <laughs> yeah, I guess I should formally apologize to you while we're here. Uh, you live in my district and I know what your, which house is yours. Um, so every time I drive by your house, I, I make sure you are aware of it and I do hit the air horn. Uh, you have asked me multiple times uh, to stop because your neighbors are not a big fan but it's just so tempting every time I drive by your house, I have to give you an air horn. Uh, I feel like it's showing love. Uh, apparently your neighbors don't feel that way, but, but it's nothing but love for you, buddy. <laughs> yeah, no, um, that's apparent. You make that very clear. You make it very clear how much you absolutely love driving in our district. And uh, we can- I'll tell you what, man. You're, yeah, and the park that we go and exercise at is, is obviously your house is on the way. And so I have to say hi on the way and on the way back. So at least twice every morning. Uh, and then every time we run a call, uh, air horn. Um, yeah, just anytime I can show you love, I try to show you love. I, I think your neighbors must just love you. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I actually have to schedule recording these podcasts around C Division shifts so that I don't get an air horn <laughs> during recording. So uh, I wanna just thank you for for uh, all that love you're sharing. Um, but. Uh, yeah, but that's not why I brought you here, Ben. Um, 
I love joking with you. Uh, we came on together. Uh, like I said, we've known each other a long time. Um, you know, I have nothing but love for you and, uh, I will fully expect to hear those air horns. But, um, what I want to talk to you about is a little bit about, um, sort of how, how your, um, your story goes. What, uh, there's a significant incident that happened with you while you were still in the back seat um, as a paramedic. I think it's safe to say that it, it changed who you are in a lot of ways. It certainly probably changed the way you approach the job. Um, I know for a long time it approached or it changed the way that you saw things. Um, and if you're comfortable sharing it with us today, uh, I think people listening will get a lot out of it. Yeah, well, thanks. And, and we, we started talking before we started broadcasting you know this is a great finance show i've been enjoying listening to it on my commute to work but i'm not a finance guy i'm a mental health guy and that's kind of what i'm known for in this department is is mental health um to the credit of our entire department no one has ever asked me for financial advice and i think that is a wise choice but i do get a lot of calls and a lot of requests for help with mental health um and, and the biggest thing, uh, you know, being financially savvy and aware is is a huge part of mental health. That all started for me. I was not a mental health guy. I did not care about mental health. I came on the job with you back in 2006, 2007. Uh, and I think like most of us that came on young, right, we were hell-bent on being the best firefighters we could be. I wanted to be on all the special teams. I wanted to be on the rescue team and the hazmat team and the, you know, anything that was more advanced, more dangerous, more training. That's, I was all in and I loved it. And I was one of those guys that didn't care about mental health. I, I didn't care about my finances. I figured I had a pension. I was good to go. Um, you know, I'm spending money faster than I can make it. I, I would have been that guy if you had struggled with mental health, I would have been the guy that said, hey, suck it up, buttercup. It's what you signed up for. And I'm, I'm very embarrassed by that. And I'm very disappointed in myself. Uh, but as you said, I got a, I got a very nice wake up call on June 24th, 2015. Uh, I was a fire medic sitting in the back seat, downtown inner city of San Diego. And we got a routine medical aid to help a, an intoxicated drunk male uh, at the trolley stop. And we arrived on scene and the trolley security guards were there. It was a Wednesday, 4 p.m. in July. Perfect weather, you know, San Diego weather. Uh, my guard is not up at all. I'm, I'm not prepared for what happens next. Um, a bystander was not happy with us uh, or with the security guards on scene. And he started a fight while I was there with my crew. And this, this gentleman, this bystander starts beating up a security guard. And so I jumped into the fight to break it up. And I, I got in between these two guys and pushed them apart. And uh, <clears throat> that guy ended up pulling a knife and stabbed me a bunch of times. Um, for those of you that are watching the video, I can share my screen. I'll just show you the video if you're up for it. Yeah. Um, well, as you're, as you're working on that, Ben, um, that was something that rocked all of us because not only did it, it may, you know, it gave a whole new, a whole new uh, meaning to the term exposed right we get exposed to all this different thing all these different things but seeing this video ben it it just really struck a chord man that that things can change in an absolute incident and while this podcast focuses primarily on financial well-being the mental well-being piece that came out of all of this uh is is the reason why we even pay attention to financial well-being in the first place is if you can't enjoy life no matter uh if if you have the wealth to do so or not um, it's not going to really matter if you're always miserable. Um, but seeing this video, and for those of you that are that are listening to this podcast, um, I'll, I'll put a link in the notes on where you can find this video. Um, for those of you that are watching on YouTube, watch closely because this it moves so quickly, it's staggering how things go from a seemingly benign incident, an everyday incident that anybody listening to this has been on a thousand times, and then it changes in the blink of an eye, and it's uh, it's actually really really terrifying. So yeah, Ben, if you can play this thing, uh, go for it. Yeah, so I'll just, you know, this video is picking up right where I had broken apart this fight. I pushed these two guys together and then, you know, it's in slow motion, but you see my hands are up and I'm, I'm trying to talk this guy down. I'm trying to calm him. I'm trying to figure out why these two gentlemen are fighting in the first place. 
Uh, but he's moving closer and closer to me and he's pulling out a knife. Uh, I found out later, much later after the trial, that this guy was a former prison inmate and he was a prison trained knife fighter. And, uh, and I mean, he just hit me with everything he had. So uh, I end up, you know, even though I'm outside, I end up kind of trapped uh, between a handrail and this guy and he, he comes at me, gets super close, and then he sticks me in the back. As you can see, he just missed my kidney, um, but he got right up chest to chest and then reached around and stabbed me in the back. And, and so I didn't know at the time that he was stabbing me. I just thought he was punching me in a really weird way. Um, and you know, you have to see it in slow motion to understand how truly, you know, you, you have to be able to see it in slow motion to see, even see the knife. Because uh, when you see it in real speed, it's so fast, you, you don't see anything. Um, and so this is, you know, the guy pulls a knife out of my kidney, and then he goes for my chest. Um, and then this one, it stuck me right behind my left arm, uh, right under my shoulder blade, and it broke a rib and punctured my lung. And so this guy is just, I mean, he's absolutely taking me apart. Uh, he pulls a knife out of my chest, and then he tried to stick me in the head. Uh, and luckily, when he pulled the knife out of my chest, all the air in my lung went out the side. It, you know, caused an immediate pneumothorax, but it caused me to double over, and I kind of, I felt like I got the wind knocked out of me. And as I doubled over, he went for my head, and he missed. And so the knife went through my hair. Uh, if I hadn't ducked, essentially, you know, he would have stuck me in the head, and I'd be, I'd be dead. Um, I'll, I do laugh though, because a lot of people see this video and they give me credit and they go, "Hey, man, you totally ducked that guy." And I just go with it. I go, well, yeah, you know, I'm kind of like a ninja. But really, it was just, it knocked the wind out of me and I doubled over. And that's the only thing that saved my life. Uh, otherwise, he would have killed me instantly. Um, so this video, you know, I like to, I like to show it when I'm talking about mental health. Uh, this set me down a whole path that I was definitely not anticipating. Uh, you know, I spent three or four days in the hospital. They had to give me a chest tube to reinflate my lung, which is the most painful thing I've ever experienced, um, but sent me home uh, with some with some pain meds and said, "Hey, you know your your lung will heal in a couple of weeks. Your stitches will come out, and you'll be ready to go back to work." And I remember thinking, "Great, like sounds good. Let's do it." But what followed afterwards was this this mental health just journey. Uh, um, you know, diagnosed with PTSD, but I I started having nightmares. I started getting more and more jumpy. I couldn't sleep. I was angry. Um, you know, I couldn't go out in public. If anybody, you know, I had a little old lady cut me off with her grocery cart at the grocery store and it was all I could do not to destroy her. Um, and so I kind of unraveled like pretty quick, which was kind of a blow to my ego that, you know, as, as tough as I think I am, it, I came apart pretty quick and, uh, and so I really had to fight my way back. I went on a journey of trying to find a good mental health clinician, which wasn't easy. Um, but when I finally found good help, um, started doing therapy like EMDR, which is eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. Really, that saved my life. That, that got me back. Um, and so what was supposed to only take two weeks ended up taking uh, six months to recover and be back to work. Um, and so since that incident and since my battle with mental health, uh, I've become a real advocate. I travel all over the country and I share my story and I try to educate departments on, on how to build a mental health program. So one of the things I've learned is, is how important finances are. And so this, this podcast you're doing is so important and I'm so excited to be here and, and share what I've learned. Yeah, man. Um, Thank you for sharing that, Ben. Um, there's a lot to to talk about there. I, I've heard this story um, several times, and I think I think this is the first time I've heard you tell it without it making you choke up, without it making me choke up. And that's not that's not to say that you know we're we're now callous to it or anything. But um, I guess time heals some wounds. But I remember a couple things that stood out to me in particular back uh, June of 2015 was. Number one, when I first saw this video, man, I was blown away at how fast that knife got in you three times. I mean, this was somebody that was trained. Like you said, this was somebody that was trained. He was going for kidneys. He's going for lungs. He's going for kill shot, which is just absolutely insane. And so um, first responders out there listening to this, 
who think, you know, the especially fire department, we we fool ourselves into thinking the public just loves us inherently. They're they're not ever going to harm us the way they do the cops. Um, is just not the case. And, and that video there highlights it. I hope everybody gets a chance to see that. And if not, we'll make sure that it, it, it'll be available to you if you want it. Um, and then the other thing, man, is when I came and saw you in the hospital, um, it, it really, it really solidified how serious it was. It, I mean, I was there, I think the following day um, after the, the incident and you were all, um, you were laid out and, and people who don't know you won't know how, happy of a person you typically are how jovial and outgoing and easy to get along with you are and and from that point forward for a while it was a different Ben and that has to be a scary thing for you absolutely and and yeah when you came to visit me I had tubes coming out of every orifice in my body um it, it was it changed me you know I was I was angry and bitter Mostly, you know, the part you don't see in the video is my partner jumped in to save me and he got stabbed as well. And, uh, and so, you know, the anger and bitterness that I made a mistake and I got my partner hurt was probably the most maddening, right? Just absolutely put me in a fury that my mistake almost got my partner killed. Um, and I, I, that weighed on me a long time. And that was probably the biggest thing that I had to overcome to get back was that, um, and honestly, you know, that, that video didn't get released for probably three or four weeks after my injury. And so I hadn't seen it. But the media, the news showed it in slow motion because it happened so fast, you can't see it in real speed. So they showed it in slow motion. Well, it turns out that's how fast you replay it in your memory anyway, right? And so I had so many questions of, you know, why didn't I go left? Why didn't I go right? Why didn't I tack? Why didn't I hit it back. You know, why didn't I do a better job of defending myself, my partner? It wasn't until the trial, which was in February. So I got stabbed in June. The trial was in February. I'm in court and they played the video for the first time in real speed. And it was so fast that I instantly felt better. Right. Cause I was like, Oh, Oh wow. Yeah. I'm, there's no way I could have done anything. Like it was so quick. And that actually made me feel better. And it really helped my healing process was, just getting to see the tape and realize, you know, I had no chance. Um, finding out the guy was a prison trade knife fighter helped. You're right? like, oh, okay. No wonder I didn't see the knife. No wonder he was so good. He practiced like quite a bit. Um, and so all of that, you know, played a part in my healing process of, of getting to see the video in real speed. Uh, but I'll tell you, man, it, there was a moment when I wasn't sure I was ever going to make it back. I, I didn't think I would ever get to work as a firefighter again. Uh, you know, my mental health was too, was in too much peril. I, I, I was in such a dark place. Uh, as you said, I was not my happy self. I was an angry, bitter person. And, and for a while I thought, you know, I'm, I'm done here. I'm going to have to go find something else to do. So. Yeah, that's a, that's a harrowing, a harrowing story, man. And, and f from the outside looking in, it looks like you have, you have made a significant recovery, you know, the, while the, the physical wounds heal, it's the mental ones that, that tend to linger, but looking at you and talking to you now, you seem to be making great progress and, you know, without minimizing that experience, can you touch on how, how like financial well-being can play a critical, um, critical role in your overall mental well-being? Yeah. And so I, I've been on this journey since 2015, uh, obviously learning about PTSD and learning about mental health. I've, like most firefighters, right, I, I've gone all in and I'm trying to learn as much as I can. And so I've been to hundreds of lectures and I've read hundreds of books and I've, you know, given lectures all over the country and I've got to talk to firefighters from all over the country. And, and I've, I've just learned about all these traps that firefighters fall in that lead to mental health issues. And I was surprised to learn how important finances are in, in maintaining a strong, uh, healthy relationship with yourself, with your loved ones, you know, how important it is to successfully navigate this career. You got to be on good financial footing. And, and so that was a surprise to me. And it really made me look at my own finances closer um, because I realized that was an area I was very weak at. 
Um, and so when you started doing this podcast and, and you know, you started holding meetings, we talked about before I sat with you at, at the meeting and you had a bunch of firefighters who are all very financially savvy. I realized pretty quick, I was the dumbest guy at that table. And I was, it was awesome. I was like, Hey man, I, I have nowhere to go, but up from here. Um, and so now that you're doing these podcasts and I'm getting to listen to them, I'm like, man, this, this needs to be a part of all mental health programs across the country is how are your finances? You know, are you on, on stable ground? Let's, let's start there and, and work our way up from there. Um, so yeah, it's, it's your education and, and everything I've learned about mental health. You have to pay attention to your finances. Yeah, that's, that's well said, man. And, and it's a shame talking about the coronavirus again, how that, the, those meetups that we were having have sort of stopped and, and what we'll wind up having to do is probably some virtual meetups uh, here coming up. But, um, you know, circling back, you felt like you were the dumbest one at that table. And I can guarantee you, um, everybody sitting there felt the exact same way. Not that you were the dumbest, but that, you know, that we all felt yeah. like you were the dumbest. But part of this, man, is, is we have to, we have to get past that. We have to, uh, respect each other and trust each other enough to know like, Hey, put your hand up. Like we talked about earlier. I, I don't know what this means over here. Can you help me? The whole, the whole in, intent of the firehouse is to push that information out, but it's, it's, so you're armed with, with some of the information, some of the knowledge that you need to go out there and take action. Like knowledge without the action isn't useful. I put something out the other day. It's like, everybody's a great idea guy. Hey, I got this great idea, but nobody wants to take action on it. It's, that's no, it's useless. I, I, I said it's, it's about as useful as a, a fog nozzle on a two and a half inch hose line. It's completely useless, but nobody wants to do anything. About it. So while you may have felt like you were the, the weakest link at that table, man, at least you're at the table in the first place. And I feel like part of why I do this, what motivates me to do this is to help people like you, like others that have questions, um, need some answers. It, it's a way that I can give back to the people that gave me so much. And it's a, you know, it's a way of me paying forward to the next generation or to guys in my generation like you. Um, but we have to trust each other. We have to be able to build that bond and um, help each other through this. Cause it's pretty apparent to me, man, especially in this city, um, there's nobody coming to rescue us. There's not. And we got to look out for each other. Right. So that's what it comes down to. Um, with all that said, though, you know, money doesn't buy happiness. It might take some of the stress away, but it's not going to necessarily make you happier if you have all these un other underlying stressors that you don't know how to deal with. Can you just speak to that a little bit? Yeah, so you, you had asked for four lessons and one piece of advice. And the first lesson for me is it's finance is a key to mental health. It's one of, of five very important pillars that I I don't know where I got the analogy from. I'm stealing it from someone and I wish I could give credit, but I look at a chair analogy uh, and all the legs of the chair are important to keep that chair upright. And one of the keys for mental health, one of the legs of that chair is finance, you know, being financially sound. The second one, money doesn't buy happiness. And it's, it's interesting because they're, and I have to be really careful who I say this to. And I jokingly gave this talk one time to a class and I'm not kidding, I stood halfway out the door because I said, the next sentence I say is going to piss you off. And if you come after me, I want to be able to be halfway to my car. I said, but raises aren't going to help you find happiness, right? And our union works their butts off to, to improve wages and uh, benefits, and they should. And I, I want to raise, I do. But what happens is, you know, we'll get a $300 a month raise. And firefighters will go out and buy a 450 a month payment new truck. And so literally they are $150 further in the hole. And so if, if raises, you know, if raises, you think that's going to solve all of your mental health, it's going to make you happy. It's not. And, and so I, I'm always very cautious because, you know, this is a popular topic around the fire table, man, if we get raises, essentially all our problems would be solved. And, you know, there, there's that expression, more money, more problems. Um, if, if you are not financially savvy, all the money in the world isn't going to help you, right? And, and what's the expression? Nothing is parted uh, faster than a fool and his money. And, and so fire department, you know, when I came on the job, I had a pension that I was good. 
And all the money I earned, that was for me to play with right now, right? Because I'm young and I'm excited and I want to travel. And I would go on these lavish vacations and I would go to the bar and I would buy a round for everybody. And I'm just not thinking about the future. You gave me a raise. Well, then I'm going to buy two rounds at the bar, right? That's not going to solve my problems. And so, you know, rule number two, money doesn't buy happiness. You can't, if you're struggling mentally, a raise will not help you. And so that's the second lesson I wanted to share. Yeah, that's perfect. Um, and with that, because, you know, you know, we should be the happiest firefighters in the country because we haven't had a raise in 15 years. Um, but w- with that being said, <laughs> uh, w- with that being said, man, um, the, the part about, you know, if we get a raise, then we're going to be set. It's, it's so it's wrong thinking because you're exactly right. So many of our guys go out and immediately go buy the big truck to go buy the big the RV, whatever. That's great. That's great. Um, but something that's important to understand, man, is those are not assets. Those are not assets. That is um, not going to help you achieve financial freedom. It might be a temporary um, thing to, to, you know, help you get by or whatever, but it's not, it's not something that we advocate here at the firehouse at all. And, and I'm reminded when you're talking about a morning meeting I had with Zeke Sanchez and his daughter, Christina, a few weeks ago that I'll link here above um, talking about when he came on, the advice that his dad gave him was for every dollar that you earn, save 10, 10 cents of every dollar. So 10% of your income. If you can just do that, you're going to be set uh, in retirement. And those like those little maxims need to get passed on. They need to get passed down the line. And this forum here, talking to people like you, um, with the mental health health part of this, it's just really important, man. When, and you alluded to a, a very famous book, right? The Richest Man in Babylon, um, which is a great book you turned me on to. Now, I had already read it, uh, but you told me to read it again, basically. And so I did, and it reminded me, right? One of the tenets is 10% of all you earn is yours to keep. And so that basic rule, man, is, is, is key. And it's funny, you know, I, I came to your meeting and you guys were so advanced and, and I said, you know, what can I do to learn? And, and you said, well, go back to the beginning, start with the building blocks, right? Richest man in Babylon uh, by George Clayson. And so I read it again and it is the most fundamental lessons in finance. And even though I'd read it before, I had to take a look at my life and go, well, I've read this book. I know the lessons and I haven't followed them. So time to start over. 10% of all I earn is mine to keep. And I've, I've now been doing a lot better job of that. And of course, I'm finding myself in a much better financial position and I'm much happier and much less stressed uh, about my paycheck. Yeah, no, that, that makes me happy to hear, man. Um, because like I was touching on before, it's like we can get the information out, but it's up to us to then go out and do something about it. It's not enough to just read the richest man in Babylon, go out and do something about it. Um, and, and for me, a huge thing is just, if, if you don't even know the first thing about financial literacy or um, mental health or anything else, go out and get yourself educated. Go have conversations with people that think a lot about this stuff. Go out and uh, check books out at the library. It costs you nothing other than your time. And there's an infinite number of resources there. Some other ones that I've read recently related to, to either personal development or the mental side, um, the top five regrets of the dying by uh, Bronnie Ware was fantastic, right? When people hit their deathbed, they're not, they're not thinking, man, I, I wish I, I really wish I would have worked a few more days. No, they're like, man, I really wish I would have told my loved ones how much they meant to me. I really wish I would have spent some more time with them. Those are the things that are important, right? The, the mental, the uh, financial well-being is great. If you use that to um, improve your mental well-being. Another great one, um, Ego is the Enemy by Ryan Holiday, talking about um, just the ways that you can just put your ego aside and, and mend fences if you have issues going on. Um, the Obstacle is the Way, another Ryan Holiday one where it's like, yeah, you might be suffering. Yeah, there might be this one thing in front of you that's causing you a lot of stress or a lot of strife. And that's part of the journey. And it's not, it's not, it's intentionally there. It's like a, you know, it's, it's fuel for your fire. It's that, that can help you improve. It can help you get better. I was talking to Jay Hobson on another morning meeting. I'll link that one here too, about this exact same thing. And you need some of these obstacles in your way to help you improve, to help you grow. Um, 
And if you can do that, then you'll have the financial well-being taken care of and your mental well-being taken care of as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love it. I just wanted to, I just wanted to touch on um, if, if you were looking back pre June 24th, 2015, what would be one piece of advice that you could give yourself or that you could give others listening to this podcast? Um, yeah, I wish I was, uh, I, I, first of all, I'm very grateful for the stabbing cause it, it really, it did alter my life, but it forced me to learn a lot more about mental health, which has led me to be a lot happier person. Um, and so, you know, you've actually talked about this with almost every one of your guests of, of be a student and learn. Um, and my advice is, is educating yourself on mental health. The fire service has so many traps that we've talked about um you know finances and and blowing our money is just one aspect um i i looked at it like a chair analogy you know the four legs i was talking about earlier so you know life satisfaction is one leg that's hobbies finances you know when you get off duty do you have something that you can do that lets you decompress uh uh something therapeutic something positive you know redoing a car or fishing with your kid or, or whatever it is that you can do for yourself, a hobby that while you're doing it, you're not thinking about work. And I think a mistake I've seen now, if I could go back and talk to my younger self, when I got off duty, I would pull an extra shift on an ambulance or I would work overtime or I would teach a class, an EMT class, sharing stories about the job. Um, I never took a break. I never let my brain decompress. I was all in all the time. And so if I could pass on, to, you know, advice of, of when you get off duty, you need to have an outlet that is constructive, that allows you to not think about the job, that lets you enjoy life, that's, that's nothing related whatsoever to the fire service. Uh, that's one leg. Uh, health and uh, physical health and sobriety is a, is a second leg. A lot of our people when they get off duty, the first thing you want to do is decompress as quickly as they can, which involves a beer in their hand. Um, and obviously that leads to a whole slew of other issues. Uh, sleep health is part of that. And alcohol actually does not improve sleep as much as we'd like to think it helps you sleep. It doesn't. Um, sleep health is important. And, and that's another thing. You know, I worked at the busiest houses, uh, trying to run as many calls as I could, as much experience as I could, as quickly as I could and I wasn't sleeping very well. And so, you know, the stabbing really helped slow me down and rethink my life's priorities. Um, and so that putting more emphasis on my sleep health and my physical health off duty is another leg that I would wish I had passed on to myself. Uh, job satisfaction is that third leg. You know, we've talked about this. It's kind of a saying, if you're not happy coming into work, you're doing it wrong because there is so much fun at, at the firehouse. So if you're not happy, you need to figure it out and you need to go to a slower station or go to a busier station or, or you know what I mean? Do something, you got to change it up because if you're not having fun at work, you're doing it wrong. And, and so that, you know, I've, I've been at those stations a few times where the, there wasn't a lot of camaraderie and it wasn't a lot of fun and there was a lot of infighting. And I tried to stick it out because I liked the firehouse. Uh, but man, when I left and went to a, work with a crew that got along night and day difference, right? Just you're having a ton of fun. Um, and so that job satisfaction, you know, change it. If you don't like something at work, change it, you know, do something different. Uh, and then the last one, the most important one. And when we talk about the leg that you need to put most of your emphasis in, it's gotta be your marriage and your support system. Um, when looking at the suicides in the fire service, one of the most common factors leading to suicide is um, the marriage is disintegrating and they're going through a divorce. And so if you want to spend any of your extra time on one leg specifically, it should be how to improve your marriage. Um, and that I think has been the best thing for me, you know, getting hurt, um, getting to spend time with more time with my wife and making sure that she knows how truly, how much I truly appreciate her. Um, that has got to be a priority for us. And I think I definitely took advantage of her. I was working all the time and I was telling myself, I'm working all the time for her. 
right? I'm doing this so that to give her a better life. And as you just said, you know, <laughs> lying on her deathbed, she's not gonna be like, man, I'm so glad my husband was at work all the time, right? She wants me there. And so that, and again, COVID helped with that, right? COVID forced me to be home. And man, I, my relationship with my wife really improved because I was home more and I was able to show my appreciation. And, um, and so those, those are the things, if I could give advice to myself or to the younger guys, is, is really take care of my chair a little better, you know? Um, take care of those legs and, and put more emphasis on finances and my sleep health and my marriage. Um, because at the end of my career, I wanna have things to fall, to fall back on, you know? I wanna sp spend my retirement with my wife. And I think at the pace I was going before I got hurt, I was gonna get divorced, right? I was probably gonna end up single uh, and alone and pretty miserable. So that's my advice. Yeah. Nothing to do with finances. No, buddy, that, that is so, so well said. And um, it's just, a, it, it's, not, it's not like earth shattering, but it's good right, right. It's just, it's good reminders, man. Like I heard it put the, just perfectly recently. Somebody said, man, you are living the good old days right now. You are going to look back at where you are right now when you're young, you have your health, you have so many great things that you are living the good old days right now. And don't waste it chasing after that, um, whatever the Joneses are doing next door, you know, like the millionaire next door book talks about. No, don't buy that fancy new truck, that fancy car, because the folks next door have that same thing. No, man, you are living the good old days right now and do everything you can to improve your relationships, do everything you can to get that sleep when you're coming off duty. Something that we just did recently that I thank my wife for literally every day is she bought us blackout curtains. So our room yes. is pitch black. It is the best thing I've ever had, man. I just absolutely love it. And then the, the final piece I'll give you, or I'll, I'm going to tag on to, um, is this is too good of a job to be sour. You know, this is too good of a job to let the, the negativity get us down, you know, and that starts, that starts at the top with us in the front seat doing a really great job of not bad mouthing the department, not bad mouthing the city or the calls that we go on. And it's easy and I'm guilty of it. It's like everybody else, but man, we have it too dang good to, uh, to, to be negative about things. Now maybe you're sitting there saying, Oh, it's easy for you. You're down at the Academy. You get to go home and sleep every night, which is true. It's great. Um, but when I, when I find myself in a funk, man, I, I find that one of the easiest ways to get out of it is doing something for somebody else. Picking somebody else up pulls you up out of that funk too, man. It's a, it's a really interesting phenomenon. And whether it's me doing something um, at the academy with the recruits down there, whether it's coaching my kids um, in sports or just picking somebody else up, man, it, it inevitably lifts you up along with it. So um, I would just add to that. Um, those four legs of your chair, man, which was just absolutely perfect. And I think, uh, yeah, I think with that, you got knocked on your first alarm, bud. Awesome, man. Thank uh, you. Hey, um, if people are looking to, to learn more about you, hear more about your journey, or maybe get that that um, video, where could they find you? Uh, yeah, so my website is www.benvernon.com. And my email is ben at benvernon.com. Um, I was speaking internationally. I, I was speaking in Canada. Uh, was going back to Canada in March to give another talk and COVID hit. So I've had like 12 different speaking engagements and, um, but they're starting to pick up again and I'm starting to speak uh, again. I think my next one's in Michigan uh, in a couple months. So that's, I, I do travel all the country and, and share my story and share lessons learned. And uh, I'm happy to talk with anybody. If anybody wants to just share their story and, and email me and uh, you know, I'm more than happy to listen. Um, but yeah, like you, I've, I've ended up helping people in Ireland and Australia and, uh, it's been, it's been good. And, and the, the themes are all the same, you know, people struggling through life and through this department, you know, trying to navigate and, and successfully finish with a strong, you know, mental health, uh, you know, finish strong mentally and physically, um, and so it's been good meeting with people and, and sharing my story and listening to theirs. So absolutely send me an email or, or you can look at my website and I'd be happy to, happy to talk with you guys. 
Awesome. That's perfect, man. I'll link to all that stuff in the show notes. And, and Benny, I, I want to just thank you again, man, for your friendship, number one, over the, the last you know decade and a half, um, for your courage and sharing your, um, your story with all of us in the San Diego Fire Department and now um, nationwide and, and internationally, because it is an important story. It's one that has to get out. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you for your time today. Hey, thanks for this and, and keep up the strong work and uh, hopefully we can help everybody uh, <laughs> navigate this career. So, yeah, man. Right on. All right. Thanks again to Ben for meeting me here in the bullpen. He's got an incredible story, one that uh, almost cost him his life and the fact that he was able to, to rally and recover both mentally and physically to get to where he is today. Uh, lecturing internationally about his, his experience is incredible. His pieces of advice about the, the four legs of the chair, about uh, life satisfaction, physical and um, physical health and sobriety, his job satisfaction, and then your marriage and support system is just perfect. It's something that all of us can probably improve on. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about Ben, you can find him on his website, benvernon.com, or you can email him, ben at benvernon.com. If you'd like to learn more about us, you can find us on Facebook at The Firehouse. That's f.i.r.e house. On Instagram, the underscore fire underscore house. On LinkedIn, The Firehouse Investors, or any place you listen to podcasts. If you learned something today and you'd like to hear more, please like, share, and subscribe, but no matter what you do, take this information, go out there, and get some. Stay now.